it stick by me and be your guiding hand but don't ask me what i think of you i might not give the answer that you want me to howdy i'm joe and this is my show joe's rides in these videos myself and my glamorous assistant caden will show you what we get up to in my workshop in town preparing mostly land rovers along with a few classic cars hot rods american cars all sorts I'll also do some videos from my workshops at home where you'll see some of my projects, more cars, bikes, hot rods, odds and sods, you name it. So if you like petrol, oil, dirt and beer, then tune in. If you're a bit woke, left wing, if you believe in climate change or you're vegan, then fuck off! Howdy, here we are in Malta. Uh, I did say that in a previous video that we come out to Malta a bit, uh, various reasons really. One, it's nice to get some sun on your back in November. It's cheap, uh, quite interested in history, particularly World War II history, of which there's a lot, uh, and mostly for the drag racing. Uh, so we're here in St Paul's Bay, our hotel, and we're gonna jump in the hire car in a minute and uh, go down to How Far Raceway and show you the uh, drag racing scene there. Uh, a lot of Mark 1 Escorts, uh, rotary engines, four cylinder rails, it's all quite a bit of a different vibe. So uh, see you there, let's go racing. So uh, here's something which I think is unique to Malta, uh, and that is these rail cars which don't run V8 engines, uh, most of them run four cylinder engines, there are, there are V8 uh, fuel cars here etc, but these I think are unique to Malta, um, I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world running them, maybe they do in the States but I've never seen them before, uh, this one's actually a six cylinder but there's a lot of uh, four cylinder cars as well, turbochargers are about as big as the engine. When I first saw them here, before I actually saw them run, I, I kind of wondered what was the point. But when you actually see them go, um, you, you'll get it, you'll see the point. They are incredibly powerful. I think it's quite impressive the amount of power they get out of these relatively small engines in the drag racing world. So hopefully we'll show you some of these running shortly. Uh, how far Raceway and Malta is really is the home of the Mark 1 Escort drag car. You never see so many Mark 1 Escorts in in one place at one time. Um, I'm not sure what's under the bonnet of this one. I'll, see, I'll sneak around the around the back of this tent and see what's under the uh, under the bonnet. Drag racing scene in Malta really has a huge Mark 1 Escort fraternity. And nearly every single one of them is absolutely immaculately presented. Uh, a lot of them run in uh, either Pintos, uh, rotary engines are really popular, as are Cosworth engines. These boys really get these cars going.
absolutely. So I was just saying that in Morgan they love a rotary engine for their drag racing. A lot of the escorts here run uh, rotary engines as well. But this little Mazda is something else. Uh, we've got a Mark 1 escort with a rotary engine uh, coming out as well behind, but I think he's missed his slot.
here I am back from uh, Malta where it was nice and warm back to the workshop here in November where it isn't nice and warm but hey oh it's to be expected it's November so today we have this Range Rover P38 I've looked after this car for probably getting on for 20 years now uh, used to be the landlords of the uh, of the pub where I uh, used to frequent uh, and it's now owned uh, by another guy uh, but he still brings it to me for, for repair uh, the problem with this P38 is the air suspension has collapsed on it which isn't uncommon on one of these um, I haven't even looked yet but I'd have a fair guess as to what the problem would be uh, and I would much rather fix the air suspension on this car because left to their own devices they're not a bad system yes they do go wrong um, sometimes the air springs themselves can perish and get small pinholes in them uh, and then you'll have the compressor which charges the system running all the time or too much of the time uh, which then overheats so worst case scenario is uh, four new air springs and a new compressor assembly which yes can be expensive and probably more than the car's worth um, but I would like to have had a look to see what was going on but he uh, cut me short during our conversation about how we're going to move forward to repair it and told me he wants to uh, fit a coil spring conversion kit on it so uh, I think it rather takes away some of the quirkiness of a Range Rover of this sort to put the coils on but um, I sort of get it as well you fit it and then there's very un very unlikely to be any problems with uh, suspension after you fitted a, a coil coil uh, conversion so that's what we're going to do don't see many of these anymore I think this is the only one I now currently look after I think uh, don't see many even going down the road do you I do remember when the whole yard and workshop was full of these things. I don't think they're a particularly bad car. Um, they had a reputation for electrical problems. Um, but bear in mind, when this car was being built, BMW owned Land Rover. So the build quality, uh, in my opinion, was, was pretty good. They don't suffer particularly from rust. Um, mechanically, they're, they're good. Um, this is a petrol model with the Rover V8 engine in it, effectively, a full litre version. Uh, and the other option they gave was the diesel which was BMW's own engine which again was a was a good engine but electronics air suspension problems like that seems to finish them off and I think that's why we don't see so many of them anymore but anyway uh, we'll crack on with this and get some coils on and get the air suspension off and show you what we do as we go along okay so Range Rover P38 air suspension to coil conversion we're going to attack the front first um, first thing we're going to do, we've, we've jacked the car up on the chassis uh, and now I want the axle to, to drop away. So what we're going to need to do is uh, get up underneath here and in there is an R-clip which holds the bottom of the air spring onto the axle. Um, that can be fun to get out, it's probably going to be seized. And also think we're going to need to uh, undo this end of the shock absorber so that will then let the axle drop right down because this shock absorber is necked out now. So it's effectively holding the axle up. So uh, we'll have this battle here and the one with the R kit and we'll probably see you in about three days when we've got those undone. Okay, the other thing we need to do on this, this corner is to access the top of the air spring. Um, and I've also decided it would probably be easier to actually do the undo the top of the shock absorber uh, as opposed to trying to undo the bottom. Uh, only the fact that the top of the shock absorber lives up here in the engine bay and it's going to be uh, the bolt that holds it on is going to be less corroded than the one which is underneath the car. So I think what we'll do is we'll we'll take the bolt uh, out the top of the shock absorber, and we need to disconnect the air supply to the air spring uh, on the top of the air spring. Uh, neither of these are particularly easy to get at, so I think we'll uh, probably remove the trunk in for the air intake, uh, along with the associated sensors and wiring and pipe work, and make ourselves a bit of room so we can see the top of the shock absorber and the top of the air spring. So we'll get on with that, we'll dig a hole, uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to see a little bit more as to what we've got to do. So we've got this P38 Range Rover uh, jacked up on the chassis, and we've disconnected the shock absorber to allow the axle to drop down, uh, which will give us access to fit the coil spring that we're gonna replace the air spring with, and also give us room to get the air spring out. This is the air spring we've taken out. I did replace these on this car uh, for the previous owner a long, long time ago, uh, and they still look to be in, in, in good condition. Um, what happens with these 
is where the air spring rolls over at the bottom, like so, that's the part of the air spring that moves when the vehicle's traveling along the road and going over bumps and lumps and potholes, etc. Uh, and the fact that that keeps moving effectively wears the rubber out. Uh, and this is generally where I see them uh, getting pinholes and cracks in, is where this rubber's moving all the time. But this, this, this one's fine. Of course, the rest of the airbag can perish over time as well. But this is normally the area where they fail. Uh, and a lot of people can't see uh, the holes or the perish in there because the airbag is effectively rolled over itself. Um, so if you think you've got a leak in air springs, uh, a good way to tell would be to put the car uh, into its off-road mode, which will effectively push these bags right up, and then you'll be able to see the bottom of them, and you, uh, you might well see if you've got any pinholes there. You can also spray them with some soapy water or something, uh, and that might reveal a leak. So that's taken out. Like I say, these look to be in good nick. Uh, just have a, uh, a push fit in air connection on the top and a, and a couple of clips to hold it into the chassis at the top there. So they're coming out. We'll show you what we're going to put in in a minute. Um, that air spring there, that's held in the bottom onto the axle via this uh, R clip. So we've pulled that out. And then uh, if you come in here, Caden, the other thing we've got to do is replace the uh, axle bump stops. So the bump stop here um, is deeper than this one supplied with the kit. That's because there's more axle travel with the uh, coil conversion kit. So we need to swap that out as well. So that's the next step. So I'm just going to briefly go through and show you some of the components used and fitted uh, during the course of replacing the air suspension with coil suspension on the P38 Range Rover. Uh, so this is one of our original air springs. Uh, this is the bottom. This is the boss that would have gone through the axle case and was then held in with, uh, with an R-clip. So we're going to replace that plastic boss with this machined aluminium one, which also has a hole through, which again in turn will be held down to the axle with that R-clip. From there, this spring pedestal, will then bolt on top of this aluminium boss. And then in turn, the spring itself will sit on this boss and pedestal and be held down through the lower coils onto those two studs with two 10 mil nuts. At the top of the air spring here is these two aluminium pegs, which go through two of four holes, which are in the top chassis cup. Um, they are now redundant and what we're going to do is fit this insulator pad onto the top of the coil. The insulator pad has got four 8mm studs which will go up through the holes in the chassis and then be retained with four 8mm nuts. We need to change the axle bump stops for shallower ones because the coil conversion actually gives the axles more suspension travel. The rears are a little bit easier in that it's just a case of bolting on these pedestals onto the axle and fitting these insulators to the, to the top of the springs. So it's all fairly straightforward, um, apart from the fact that you're going to come across a lot of the fixings and things you've got to undo are going to, be, are going to be seized, which is what we're finding as we go along the way, but that's fairly par for the course. The other thing we need to do is do something with the electrics. So once we've disconnected all the height sensors, etc., etc., it's going to send the car crazy. It's going to think everything's gone wrong. So this wiring kit is going to plug into the body control unit and potentially fool the car into thinking that the air suspension is all working well. Um, none of these wires are colour coded. Um, I'm fairly sure uh, that they're going to be replicating uh, what the ride height sensors and compressor signals are giving to the BCU. Uh, so that's the thing that we need to do inside the car. So it's all uh, fairly straightforward, but fairly time consuming. <clears throat> the other thing we have here on the bench is this magical mystery box. Now then, inside this magical mystery box is a jelly bean. Now I'm sure most of you know what jelly beans are and I'm sure plenty of you have, have eaten them in the past, but not many of you might know where they come from and how they're made. Now then, where they come from uh, is actually Madagascar. 
and how they're made is somewhat of a, a, a sad story, really. Um, for all intents and purposes, they are just beans, very similar to uh, our broad beans uh, that you know people grow in allotments and so forth uh, here, here in England. So they are just uh, a, a cousin of the broad bean, <clears throat> but the, uh, the the colours and the and the coatings are applied by homeless blind children, um, which are subjected to do this under a, a slave labour regime, really. So they sit there and they have to get a small brush and paint a sugary paint onto each one uh, to give it the different colour and taste that you expect when you eat these jelly beans. It's rather sad, really. Um, it's something that you might want to write to your MP about. But in the meantime, I'm kind of finding myself turning into a bit of a geek, turning about these springs and jelly beans. <laughs> it's so sad, but they are tasty. So we've got the near side front corner of this P38 Range Rover stripped out now, ready for the core conversion. One of the things you need to do is to take a few of the clips out of the trailing edge of this uh, wheel arch liner and get your hand up and disconnect the height sensor, uh, the sensor that would have been uh, relevant to the air suspension. But I have found if you just go the extra mile and take the rest of the clips out of the wheel arch liner, remove it all together, like we just have, then it gives you loads more access in here to then fit the top spring perch and more room just in general and light to fit the front spring. So yeah, take the whole liner out. It'll be easier in the long run. Okay, so we've fitted the front coil springs now, uh, put all the front axle back together, that's back on its wheels, and we moved on to the rear here. Um, so the way we've elected to do this is we've put this large axle stand underneath the tow bar uh, and then we're going to drop the ramp away, which effectively will take the chassis of the car up in the air, leaving the axle uh, free, to, free to swing. So we've disconnected the bottom of the rear shock absorbers, and we've disconnected the bottom of the rear air springs. Now we've taken this wheel off, and we're obviously going to do the same on the other side, pull this wheel arch liner out, which then will give us access. It's not particularly easy to see. Uh, access through this gap here between the body and the chassis where we'll find the clips which retain the top of the air spring and the air supply for that air spring. So we'll get those out um, and then we can do the same the other side and we can start looking at putting the rear springs in. Alrighty, so we've uh, pretty much finished the mechanical side of this uh, suspension conversion, i.e. all the coil springs and associated hardware are now fitted underneath the car. Uh, and all the air suspension has been removed, uh, along with the ride height sensors, uh, air supply, etc, etc. Uh, so now we're just dealing with the electrical side of things. So we need to trick the body control unit into thinking that the air suspension is still active, otherwise it will bring up a, a myriad of lights on the dash. So the kit comes with a piggyback harness which plugs into the body control unit uh, where the plug for the air suspension comes out of the body control unit. Uh, and that in, its, in itself then plugs back into the uh, piggyback harness, falling the car into thinking all is well. Um, it also picks up a positive and a negative here on the body control unit. So uh, now we've got to uh, remove the ride height switch, pull the wires off the back of that, reconnect the battery, and then fingers crossed, when we put the ignition on and start it up, there's no lights on the dash, we shall see. I've well, just given this old Range Rover a short road test and uh, seems to ride really well on its coil suspension. Not as nice in my opinion as the air suspension and um, I wasn't too keen on taking it off and doing this conversion but uh, the customer was. And I sort of get it, um, now it's fitted with this uh, coil suspension there's very little to go wrong. Uh, in fact I guess the suspension will probably outlast the car in this case. So there we go, no warning lights, uh, everything was a, a success. That just remains for me to say, hey you, remember, like and subscribe.